Good evening. I'm Dr. Patrick Lewis, Director of Collections and Research, and we are so glad that you joined us both in person and virtually for tonight's lecture for Backwoods Modernity, Kentucky's Role in the Rise of Country Music and Media. Kyle Barnett is an Associate Professor of Media Studies in, at, in Bellarmine University's Department of Communication. He is published in the Journal of Popular Music Studies, Music, Sound, and the Moving Image, the Journal of Material Culture, and several book anthologies. His first book, Record Cultures, The Transformation of the U.S. Recording Industry, from the University of Michigan Press, was named 2021's Best Historical Research on Record Labels and General Recording History by the Association for Recorded Sound Collections. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. If you have a question, please come to the microphone at the front of the room, or if you're joining us virtually, drop them in the chat. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kyle Barnett. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm I'm uh, really appreciative you, you came out, and um, this building is amazing. And uh, I appreciate you spending some time with me. Uh, so tonight's uh, talk uh, is called "Backwards Modernity: uh, Kentucky's Role in the Rise of Country Music and Media," and uh, I. I had some knowledge of, of country music before I got into this project, but it gave me all new levels of appreciation. And since I found myself in Kentucky after finishing grad school, I only thought I should dig in further, uh, which I have. So I, I'm gonna begin by giving a little background on my project, uh, a little, little theoretical, but not too much for too long. And uh, then after that, I will uh, kind of lay out what, what, what I plan to do. Basically, what I wanted to do is, uh, talk to you about what the title says, Kentucky's role in uh, country as a popular music, but also the kind of media side. And so how country music as a genre uh, emerged uh, in and through media, basically. That's kind of what I'm after. So anyway, uh, so I showed up at the University of Texas, Austin, with the greatest of intentions. I had uh, grew up in Indianapolis. Uh, and uh, had gone to my uh, master's program at Bowling Green State University, the other Bowling Green, as we know it in Kentucky, uh, up in Ohio, and then I uh, uh, found myself in Austin, Texas. And I showed up, you know, with this idea that I was going to do a proper film studies dissertation. I had been steeping in film uh, and media, and I'd really ready, I was ready to make the jump. And at this new department I was in, uh, many of the leading media history scholars, film and media history scholars, TV studies, uh, particularly film industry studies, were all there. So I was like, this is perfect. Here's, here's what I should be doing. But as the classes began, I started to notice something a little bit odd. Uh, and that's Texas campus, right? <laughs> uh, but so the nagging question for me as I kept sort of, I was just sitting in these incredible classes. And I was learning so much. Uh, I was seeing so many films, watching so much TV, listening to so much radio. Uh, but I, I started to get really bothered at the absence of the recording industry. The recording industry is this weird in-between sort of institution where, you know, we, we associate popular music with performance as much as we do sound recordings. And we tend to talk about media that's narrative and involves spoken word narratives. We don't really know what to do with music, right? How do you talk about music? We don't have the same sort of vocabulary for describing and discussing music. So I was thinking, wait a minute, sound recordings are part of the raw material for all these other media, right? Radio and television and films and everything else. So why aren't we talking about Though So uh, against maybe my better judgment, I decided to follow that question. Uh, my professor warned me I might be heading into the tall weeds. Uh, another professor who I interviewed with at the University of Illinois Chicago said, well, I really like your work, but you know, you'll have to leave the United States. Uh, and he was, he was saying, you know, maybe, you know, pop music and media, they do that in England, they do it in Australia, they do that in Canada, we don't do that so much in the United States, right? So no one had told Bellarmine this. Uh, and so uh, I was quite fortunate to uh, 
to get a job. And Ruth Wagner, who actually interviewed me in Boston, Massachusetts, can attest to this. I mispronounced the name of the university at the interview. And I thought, well, that's, I didn't get that job. There's no way. <laughs> and when she came over to ask some follow-up questions, I was very, very grateful. So, um, so why think about the recording industry uh, uh, as media? You know, why, and why this history in particular? So the 1920s and 1930s were crucial for American media. A lot of things were emerging between the world wars, you know, radio, uh, sound recording and pop music is emerging in a new way and film is entering its sort of classical Hollywood golden age. Um, so uh, also if you start taking a close look at the record business during this period, every assumption I had was wrong, basically. Like a lot of what I thought I knew uh, wasn't the case. Um, and then, as I've already mentioned, the, the record industry intersects with all these other media industries at the same time. The other thing is I started to notice that, uh, you know, the repeating patterns in history. When streaming started to really emerge, I thought, well, this reminds me of radio in 1932, <laughs> right? You know, that some of the same concerns we have over format, over economics, over how to make money at popular music, these patterns repeat panics about new genres. Is this, is a record player going to be good for the kids? All that sort of thing, right? Um, that was there all the way back then. So um, uh, this, uh, but this photo, if I have time later, I'll mention this is Taylor's Kentucky Boys. Dennis Taylor was a, a talent scout for a record company I'm going to talk about tonight called Jeanette Records. Um, uh, interestingly, it was an interracial band. And so for the, the, the country, photos, the white performers would be depicted, and then some of the African-American performers were not uh, invited to. And so there's a really interesting back and forth on race and musical genres. Uh, very strange. Uh, anyway, so um, I'm almost through. This is the last slide of any kind of anything close to theory. So you've stuck with me. Nicely done. Almost. Done. Okay. Um, so uh, when, so I, you know, being at the Filson, this is I'm in heaven, right? So I love a good archive. I love archives. It's all about the detective work, right? You know, the chance that in the next file, you're gonna see something that no one else has seen for decades, right? Uh, and so when I realized that most archives, you know, ha only have so many people to catalog materials and the rest is kind of unknown, well, that just really spurred me on. So, um, so when I'm digging through archives, I'm always asking, you know, who's missing? Like who, whose materials did we not save? Which voices are not here? Or, you know, uh, and then also wh which archives are all my friends going to and where might I go that's different? For instance, I went to the Library of Congress. I also went to county historical societies and record collectors, attics and basements and all sorts of different kinds of places. So, um, and I think that really helped the project. Um, so, I'm also, last thing to mention here is that I'm really looking at media companies, in this case, record companies, as cultural institutions that have certain attitudes and beliefs and dispositions about what they do and why they do it. And once you can get inside and to have a sense of kind of how they see themselves and what they do, you have a much better sense of the kind of decision making they do. So, why is this record, why is Motown like Motown? Why is Google like Google? Why is MGM like MGM? That sort of thing. Um, so uh, I have, uh, I, I got the uh, title for my talk from a, a, a quote from the radio studies scholar, Michelle Helms, another Indianapolis uh, native, uh, but she uh, spent her career up at the University of Wisconsin. And so, she talked about the barn dance radio shows of the 1930s as, quote, the backwoods of modernity. So I, I want to talk about the rise of country music as a genre in a similar way, thinking about it as this sort of backwoods of modernity. Country music's emergence in the 1920s is really fascinating, right? So you have women's suffrage. You have uh, the sort of expansion of rights, and you have the sort of flapper culture, and you have a sort of this expansion of all sorts of things going on in the 20s, you also have this backlash, right, with the rise of anti-immigrant sentiments, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, 
uh, D.W. Griffith, who is buried not far from here, the first film to ever be shown in the White House was uh, his, uh, uh, his, uh, his famous film. Um, and, uh, you know, there's footage of the Klan marching right on Pennsylvania Avenue. So um, some of the concerns we have maybe more recently are echoed a century ago. Um, so uh, thinking about this movement that at its, begin at its very beginnings is looking back. The very earliest country songs to be put on record are talking about the little old cabin on the lane. Like it's already nostalgic. It's already looking backward at its inception. But it's also like modern enough that it is, that the music is being heard on radio, that new technology. So on the one hand, it's, it's looking back with more than a little nostalgia, right? From its inception. And at the same time, it's showing up in contemporary media in an aggressive way, right? Uh, and so that to me has always really been fascinating. Uh, and so, uh, and um, I'll be talking a lot about sort of these performers and sort of how they negotiated their own uh, 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 images, but the, the scholar Richard Peterson talks about how these, these performers would often appear in suit and tie in some, uh, uh, promotional materials, and then other times they would be asked to put on the overalls, and there's a kind of a performance to it, right? In Jimmy Rogers' case, he would dress up as a railroad brakeman for some shows, a vaudevillian with a, with a bow tie and other shows, and then finally um, uh, dressed as sort of a Texas cowboy. Um, so the record business in the 1920s was dominated by three record companies. They were all centered in the Northeast, right? And so they were recording things that were nearby, right? So the three, the big three, as they were known, uh, were Columbia Records, uh, uh, based out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. They also all had New York presences. Uh, Victor Records in Camden, New Jersey, and Edison Records in uh, Orange, New Jersey. So all around the New York metro area. So they're recording a huge swath of, of vernacular culture spoken word things and music and it's everything i mean you know you can record a lot of things in and around new york city right and people were traveling there too but they were also missing a lot of things that they had never recorded you know not you know on the other side of the smoky mountains essentially um so uh so near the end of world war one beginning of the early 1920s a few record companies began well, i guess we would call them startups now right so you know, there was a tech boom in the late teens, early 20s, but instead of computers and the internet, it was phonograph, phonographs and phonograph records, basically. So a lot of young upstart companies were getting involved, uh, which takes me to this record company, which was hugely important uh, in jazz and in blues, but also in country. Jazz was known as jazz, blues was known as race records, and that's a whole other conversation. Uh, it was used in positive terms and also sometimes pejorative uh, terms. Uh, and then country, which was known, they couldn't quite get a name to stick early on, so they called it old time music. Later on, hillbilly music becomes quite popular. Uh, and there's a lot of different you know, kinds of ways to package uh, the, the, the genre's name. But so um, Richmond, Indiana, uh, was the home of uh, a company called Star Piano Company. And the piano business was on the decline by the, by the teens. And uh, the company decided to take a chance on an emerging business, which is the phonograph and uh, phono uh, sound recording industry. So you get Jeanette Records. So I thought it was Gannette for years. It's Jeanette um, Records. And this was their uh, uh, Star Piano and, and uh, Jeanette Records, uh, Industrial Works in Richmond, Indiana, right there along, Richmond is uh, along the sort of Indiana, Ohio border, uh, some roughly halfway between Cincinnati and Indianapolis, I guess. Um, so that's the, uh, this is the Industrial Works uh, in, in, uh, in Richmond. It's quite a whole little, you know, operation there. And uh, Jeanette, records had uh, an advantage because its parent company, Star Piano, had 
shops, retail shops all over North and South America. So you, ha you had a built-in distribution network already to get the, the recordings out there. Star Piano and Jeanette Records later would be involved in over 60 record labels around the world. So Australia, Asia, North America, South America, Europe, recording in bunches of different languages, all in about a 20 year period. Um, so, uh, so that was all uh, happening uh, at the, around the same time, a little bit before country music's emergence. Okay. Uh, so tiny little Jeanette of Richmond, Indiana, picked a fight with Victor Records. I don't know how you would just, I mean, Victor was like Microsoft. Victor was like, I mean, a big, 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 powerful company, right? And so Jeanette, you know, had the courage to essentially sue Victor Records over format. I'm not going to get into, uh, you know, differences in format a, a century later, <laughs> but but essentially, Columbia Records and Victor Records, you could only play Columbia and Victor Records on their machines. You couldn't play records from other record labels, OK Records, Paramount Records, Vocalion Records, Jeanette Records. You, could, you couldn't play them on Victor or Columbia Records. So Jeanette sued. It went to the US Supreme Court. And in 1922, Jeanette won. So it's like David beats Goliath, essentially, is what happens. And all the other record companies are thrilled because this gives them an opening. So suddenly, all these upstart record companies, mostly in the Great Lakes Midwest, mostly emerging out of old furniture companies, piano companies, that sort of thing, uh, get into the business. They begin to record everything. They're, they're doing all kinds of recording. So these are all labels related to, the, to Jeanette, including an advertisement for Moxie Soda, which you can still buy, I think, up in the Northeast, especially if you want to. A, a, a can of Moxie, you can still buy that. So um, pretty much every media, pretty much every every media uh, uh, practice that we associate with media later on were present with the phonograph. We just don't, we just associate records with music, but all kinds of things were happening. Uh, so um, to give you some sense, uh, this is uh, William Jennings Bryant re re recording a version of his Cross of Gold speech. He recorded his Cross of Gold speech for pretty much anyone who would ask. Uh, and Jeanette asks, asks so, <laughs> and then you can see it's a very, very acoustic studio, right? So if you want to turn the volume up, you move right up to the horn. If someone plays awfully loudly, you put them in the back of the room. You know, you control the volume by, by where the players are in the room. And so, of course, you know, Brian is up in front, you know, uh, uh, speaking into the into the horn. Uh, Jeanette did physical fitness records, known as physical culture records. I have a couple of them, usually some orchestra and then some someone going one, two, three, four. Uh, Jeanette recorded all sorts of things, including uh, they had a mobile unit that recorded the Hopi Indian tribe, the indigenous tribe at the uh, Grand Canyon. So they were doing all kinds of things. Um, uh, country music was not Jeanette's first claim to fame. Uh, in fact, the first genre that it really became known for, maybe still most known for, was jazz. So Chicago is not that far from Richmond, Indiana, and uh, they had a, uh, um, Jeanette had a star piano company on Wabash Avenue uh, in the South Loop in Chicago, and so they would use their retail shops as a place to do some scouting, right? And so they were getting reports back in Richmond of this new genre, you know, that the folks are calling jazz and we should really try it out and see what happens, you know? And so they recorded a few folks, including uh, King Oliver's Creole Jazz Band who came up, you know, you know, doing the, the, uh, the, the boat circuit on the Mississippi, played Davenport, eventually over to Chicago. Uh, King Oliver uh, is, the, the gentleman second from the right, third from the right is a young Louis Armstrong. Uh, and that is his, uh, his then spouse, Lil Harden Armstrong at the piano. Baby Dodds is in this band, um, all kinds of people. So Gene Autry recorded it, Bix Beiderbeck, Hoagie Carmichael, uh, just on down the line. I mean, just, um, oh, a young Lawrence Welk <laughs> recorded there. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, lot, you know, this was you know in, in his wilder day. He, he apparently had wilder days. So, um, but anyway, 
Okay. So um, later on in the 1920s, though, Jeanette got involved in uh, what was then called old time music. And so uh, this was an important niche for Jeanette as the, uh, as the larger labels caught up with what the smaller labels were doing. They had to kind of, you know, dig around and find some new things. You know, if, if Victor or, you know, another big label would catch up, then they would say, what else can we do, right? And so old time music or hillbilly music became an important uh, um, part of what they did. A lot of what they recorded were so-called string bands from Indiana, Kentucky, and from around the, the South and the Midwest. Um, standing, well, you can see their names there, but second from the right is the guy, Dennis Taylor. And uh, Taylor was a, a kind of a, called a record man, a sort of an artisan, artisan repertoire man. Uh, a scout that would go out and find talent and he would often put his name on you know artists he would uh invite you know taylor's kentucky boys there's no taylor in the band that's their manager right basically taylor's kentucky boys uh and that sort of thing and so um you see this is doc roberts who we'll talk about later the fiddle player from uh uh he's from i believe richmond kentucky and uh and some other of his uh compatriots who went up I got a train ticket up to Richmond, Indiana to, to play a couple songs. So Doc Roberts, I learned a lot from Doc Roberts uh, when I was doing research for my book, Record Cultures, uh, uh, partly because Roberts' papers are at Berea College, uh, the archives at Berea. And so I spent a couple uh, days over one summer in Berea kind of studying what, uh, what Roberts was up to. And so this is a photo I believe it was taken in Chicago at a photo studio of Doc Roberts on the fiddle and Edgar Boaz on guitar. And then in the background, you can see Jeanette Records uh, releases on the wall, basically. So um, uh, Roberts uh, became a recording artist primarily for uh, Jeanette. Um, but then he started to realize, wait, so scouts make money for bringing people to record companies. So he would go up to Jeanette Records in Richmond and say, I know this fellow that plays guitar real good. And then next time up, they would, you know, here's another ticket, you know, and, and bring someone else. And then Jeanette would give him a little money in addition to sort of uh, for payment for that. So in the Berea archives, uh, there are a number of letters that Doc Roberts received uh, from Jeanette, but also from competing record labels and from organizations. And my favorite, uh, I became a huge fan of stationery, as you might imagine, but my favorite station, stationery by far was from the Louisville Credit Men's Association. Uh, and so in 1927, they were, uh, they were um, uh, celebrating their 32, 32nd annual convention and uh, this great little sign up, should, which should be a t-shirt, shouldn't it? Um, whenever I want my friend, whenever I'm feeling lonely in Louisville and I want my friends to visit, I just send them that. Lovely, lively Louisville looks longingly for you. It's in old Kentucky. So let them know we're still here, anyway. Um, and so, you know, we, I learned an awful lot. So in addition to record companies, uh, furniture shops were involved in the record business. Why would furniture shops be involved in the record business? It goes something like this. Thomas Edison needed cabinets for phonographs, so families, particularly women's as stewards of the home, would accept these, this new technology into domestic space. What is this thing? What is this horn? Oh, I don't want this in my house. It's terrible, right? And so, you know, they, they developed these, these uh, cabinets and the record companies really tried to appeal uh, uh, to, to women as sort of, you know, stewards of the home and, and, and assigned to, you know, to sort of edify the children. Um, and so this led to furniture companies being involved in phonographs and then phonograph records, and then finally like actually recordings and scouting. Uh, Spiritu Brothers was a famous furniture uh, uh, company out of Knoxville, Tennessee, that did a lot of work uh, on, on the behalf of diff different record labels and, and of, of themselves. In this letter, actually, I think they're, they're saying like, oh, those Jeanette records, and they spelled it wrong. Those Jeanette records, they, they're good, you, you're great, but they don't sound very good. I know some labels that'll make, make you sound great, you know. Um, and then over here on the side, I found this, this uh, a letter from a P.I. Burks and Company. They were a distributor. I, I know you can't really see it real well, but P.I. Burks 
which was a distributor of Paramount Records and phonographs out of uh, Port Washington, Wisconsin. They, were, they released a lot of Delta Blues, by the way. So your jazz came from Indiana and your blues came from Wisconsin. So, you know, no one thought to record in New Orleans until later. Anyway, so P.I. Burks uh, was sort of trying to uh, court, um, court Doc Roberts. And I, just out of curiosity, I, I looked up P.I. Burks. They're still in business. Uh, they started like 1905 or something. And apparently, at least before the pandemic, uh, there's a, uh, they're on uh, South 7th Street. Uh, computer uh, distributors, electronics, this sort of thing. I need to contact them and say, did you keep anything from grandpa's old files or great grandpa's old files? So anyway, uh, so, you know, country music starts to become quite popular, uh, and, uh, particularly after 1927 or so. It's the last of the three big genres to emerge, which is crazy. Jazz emerges first, then blues. Finally, essentially white middle-class scouts think to record country music, music from their country cousins, right? There's, I, there might be some class stuff going on there. Interesting, like why did you only think of it now? Similarly with black scouts and jazz, the scouts often liked classical music and they're like, I don't know about this blues and jazz. So anyway, so Bradley Kincaid, a Berea, Kentucky native, a Jeanette recording artist, and he was a, a star of WLS's National Barn Dance. WLS Radio World's Largest Store for Sears. Um, and so old time performers had to um, uh, perform in uh, a certain kind of outfit. Uh, and so while his, he would take his portraits in suit and tie, um, he would have to put on sort of farm clothing for performance, right? Um, and uh, uh, I think I'll skip that particular clip because I want to get on to some other things. But um, uh, which leads me to this fascinating letter, okay. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Berea archives, there's something like an eight page letter from a Mrs. Emma Aikman of Hamilton, Ohio, and she's a Kentucky transplant. And she writes a letter on April 9th of 1931 to Bradley Kincaid. And she says, our dear Bradley, she spells Bradley wrong, we're gonna give it to her, question mark, do you notice the question mark? I mean that. It is not an error. <laughs> and she rips into him for the next seven or eight pages because he had performed at Hamilton, Ohio, and he had worn uh, overalls, straw hat, you know, kind of country bumpkin sort of attire, right? And so Emma Aikman goes on page after page after page. You embarrassed us in front of the Yankees, you know? Now, someone from Indiana, I do not think of myself as a Yankee. I think that to me, that's New England somewhere. But apparently, Hamilton, Ohio, for Ms. Emma Aikman, counted as way up north Yankee territory. Okay. So, but she was furious, completely furious. And so, what was fascinating is Bradley Kincaid kept that eight page letter and he replied to her, right? My dear Ms. Aikman, I have just received your letter uh, commenting on my theater appearance at Hamilton. Um, and I hasten to tell you how very, very sorry I am and that I've made the wrong impression on my Kentucky friends. I assure you that it was not my intention to, uh, to do so at all. I can, you know, it basically said it's expected of me. They want me to put the clothes on, right? That, that's part of the performance. Um, he said, I, I, um, I certainly would not wish to do anything to reflect upon the people of the mountains, for I'm very proud of the fact that I'm a mountaineer and that my father and grandfather have been for many years respected members of the Hill Kentucky tribe, right? And so this really fascinating back and forth, right? And in and, and Emma's letter, I mean, she is, uh, she's telling me, you know, you embarrass the people from this county and that county and this county. And it's really, ooh, she was on a roll. She was on a roll. Um, and so I just found that fascinating, the sort of moment where sort of the emergence of country is being negotiated. You know, what does this mean? What is this going to be? Are you, is this, is this hillbilly, hillbilly thing going to follow us from literature and folklore into these new media? Yes, it will. Um, so I want to stop for a moment because a lot of the folks that were um, uh, handling this, this music uh, and recording this music were kind of middle class business folks that were known as record men. Later on, they would be known as A&R men or arts and repertoire men. There were women doing this sort of work, but they were often not understood as record scouts. Uh, they were doing the work and not being recognized 
for doing the work. Uh, they were also maybe not even understanding what they were doing themselves at a certain level, which I think is really sad. Um, there's, so there's much work to be done in this regard. But so off the top, we have Ralph Peer. Ralph Peer is famous for the Big Bang of country music, 1927, Bristol, uh, the Bristol Sessions, right along the Tennessee Virginia border. He records Jimmy Rogers and he records Carter family. Uh, down below, Art Satherly uh, he worked uh, at a blues label, largely blues label called Paramount Records. Later on, he works for Columbia Records. They're both in the uh, Country Music Hall of Fame. Ralph Peer was more of the businessman. He's a genius, but he's more of a businessman. And get a load of that photograph, right? He's like, oh, you must have, you caught me here in my study. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm just drawing, I'm painting one of my orchids. Yes, I'm an orchid collector. Of course I am, right? So clearly, you know, a bit of a social climber, right? He sort of comes from sort of petite bourgeois, working class background. Art Sadly, on their hand, comes from Britain, right? He was testing Triumph motorcycles from uh, Land's End to John O'Groats, as the British say, top to bottom uh, of England. And he wants to meet, so he wants to meet some Native Americans. He wants to come to the United States. So he chooses what sounded like an uh, uh, Indian name to him, Milwaukee. So he goes to Milwaukee. Uh, and uh, shortly after, he gets involved in the Wisconsin Chair Company, which becomes Paramount Records. So Peer, you know, really sees the folks he records. He mythologizes them, but also, and befriends them, but also sees them as a means to an end. Sadly, almost is more American than American. He's, he's making arguments about uh, uh, the, the quality of what he calls the country people, meaning the blues people and the jazz people and the, and the country people. He wants to sort of like, Prop them up. He's almost making a proto folklore or, or civil rights argument in what he does. So, um, Columbia Records, Frank Walker, uh, he was out scouting, and he, these sorts of ads would appear in local newspapers. Can you sing or play old time music? Um, and, uh, and so uh, he would be out scouting, listening to musicians, but sometimes he would just try to sell some records. So, one night he set up, one afternoon rather, he set up shop at a Corbin, Kentucky. Uh, 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 sort of a uh, convenience store, drugstore. And um, all the townspeople came and he played Columbia Records. And the, as the afternoon went along, they, no one was leaving. Everyone was listening intently, but no one was buying a thing. And so finally, Walker went over to the, the, the manager of the store and said, like, they seem to really be enjoying themselves, but they're not buying anything. And, and the manager whispered back, like, they love the music, but they can't afford to buy, right? And so... Uh, you know, Walker sort of promised to bring back some maybe lower cost discount recordings. Um, and then finally, the manager to get everyone out of the shop recommended uh, an opera recording, some light opera by Enrico Caruso uh, to uh, to clear the room, uh, which uh, which occurred, which occurred. Um, so uh, I'm going to I'm going to pause it just I. I was holding off on playing a couple of clips. I'm going to play a few brief ones right after this. But um, uh, in the early 1930s, uh, the, the two most famous names in uh, country music in the early days, Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family, right? Sort of really country royalty. And they were asked to come to Louisville, Kentucky's Main Street in 1931 for a recording session. So Ralph Peer had set up shop in his mobile recording unit in an abandoned storefront on Main Street in Louisville, right? And they recorded a bunch of different folks. They recorded the Louisville Jug Band. They recorded all, all sorts of folks uh, while they're in town. Um, but they, uh, they, and they also recorded a lot of music from Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family, uh, mostly music, but they also recorded a uh, uh, promotional spoken word record. I'm going to give you a little taste of. Um, but first, let me, I'm just going to give you a sense of what these sound like. So first, I was talking to you earlier about Fiddlin' Doc Roberts from Richmond, Kentucky. I'll dip into this. This is a Champion Records release, which was a uh, Jeanette sub sub uh, subsidiary. <laughs> so he was playing a lot of dancing and things like that, you know, it's kind of party music often. <clears throat> Bradley Kincaid was almost more of like a folk person. Like he was playing the traditional music, but from a little bit of distance, almost like he was studying it. Like he was a little more bookish than, than Doc Roberts was. 
Um, this is Barbara Allen by uh, Bradley Kincaid, who later became a big star on WLS, National Bar Dance Chicago, and then WLW, Cincinnati, which is a connection with the Renfro Valley uh, uh, Barn Dance. And then it, it's in Cincinnati for a while. It's in Dayton for a while. Anyway. In Scarlet Town, where I was born, there was a family made dwelling, made every year, cry well away. Her name was Barbara Allen. It was. Um, and so, and then here's a little bit of uh, Jimmy Rogers pretending to visit the Carter family in Virginia. And then uh, the, the Carter family then follows up by pretending to visit Jimmy Rogers in Texas. So this was recorded on uh, Main Street, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, 1931. <laughs> Who's that strange car coming up the way? Uh, could be a revenuer. Could be a revenuer. Um, it's got Texas plates. Well, that's Jimmy Rogers. Hey, hey, howdy, folks. The yodeling. <laughs> the yodeling was for authenticity. Indeed, it was Jimmy Rogers, yeah, coming up the way. So, really, and the nice sound, I think. That's a really nice recording for a storefront, in, you know, in 1931. Anyway, uh, yeah, pretty impressive. Um, uh, and so, um, let's see. So I would like to close that. Okay, okay good. we're very good. All right. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, um, the phonograph in the age of radio. When radio emerges, it's really catching on in the last years of the 1920s and the early days of the Great Depression. So, your choice is this, right? The, the economy has collapsed, nothing like what we've, nothing like we, we've seen much worse, right? Your choice is, do you buy records still on that old family phonograph, or do you buy a radio and sit through the sponsorship messages to hear music for free? You buy it once, right? It's similar in a lot of ways to that streaming debate that, you know, from a, a number of years ago. Um, so, uh, by then, the uh, the acoustic phonograph wasn't sounding so great. Some record companies were able to transition into electrical recording. Certainly, Victor and Columbia and those folks could do that. So the the, the movies become talkies. Radio uses electricity, and the the, the sound recording business gets into uh, electrical recording and playback too. Uh, blows my mind when I show my students that early phonographs were mechanical and not electric. Um, so. Uh, and so Jeanette Records makes this transition and they're still recording country music uh, for folks. Um, but a lot of folks get, get out of the business almost right away. Within a couple weeks of the stock market crash in 1929, Edison, Thomas Edison, who invents the phonograph, gets out of the record business, right? Um, Victor Records is already purchased by RCA. Columbia Records falls so far that in part of the Great Depression, they turned to selling a home dry cleaning kit. I thought this was I thought this was an April Fool's thing. I saw it in a collector's magazine. I didn't think it was real until I went to the Library of Congress and I saw it for myself in an old uh, record industry journal. And there it was, the Columbia Records home dry cleaning kit. It was a big tank that you bought. You put the clothes in there. Brr, brr, brr. I mean, it did not sell. It did not sell. <clears throat> <laughs> and so I, I just love this is Edison saying, you know, radio's the bunk. Ah, oh, so's your old phonograph, right? So format battle. So um, this it's in this period when 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 so-called barn dance radio really really starts to emerge. Like so, you have the Grand Ole Opry, uh, uh, and you have you know even before that the uh, WLS Chicago's National Barn Dance heard around the country, particularly in the uh, Great Lakes and Great Plains Midwest, and certainly into into the South. It didn't quite sound like country music though, like some vaudevillian moves were sneaking in and it was becoming more like general entertainment and not the kind of thing we were hearing on sound recording. So it's already starting to change. <clears throat> and so, uh, uh, you know, we're starting to see old time or hillbilly music beginning to change. So 
Um, I teach a film musicals class at Bellarmine. I have a very good day job, I gotta tell you. Uh, so, uh, but in this, in this musical I show called Gold Diggers of 1933, there's a, a moment in the vaudeville manager's office where a group of men come in uh, proclaiming themselves as hillbillies, but they all speak in a very, very heavy Eastern European accent. Like they just came in to Ellis Island and they're ready to be hillbillies. They just need to learn how, right? <clears throat> and so, you know, anyway, and so you get the rise of what I term as like so-called synthetic hillbillies, right? Um, playing up, you know, I mean, even like Creedence Clearwater Revival, right? They're from Northern California, but they're, they sound like they're working pretty hard. It sounded like they're from Louisiana on those first couple of records. Love them, just saying. <laughs> so what happened to a lot of these small startup record labels? Well, a lot of them closed shop. Uh, there's stories about some of the metal masters of these blues, jazz, and country recordings being used to make pig sheds on farms, being thrown into, because records are over, right? In 1934, it's all over. Uh, they're throwing uh, metal masters supposedly into the river in Richmond and up in Wisconsin. Uh, you know, for decades, people who didn't bother to throw them out, they would be under, records would be under beds and in attics and in the 50s and 60s and 70s all these collectors are going back through and like what do you have um but anyway it seemed really seemed over so the one bright spot for Jeanette records that lasted through the early 30s was they were doing sound effects recordings largely for the the kind of silent film market and then later a bit also for radio uh and uh and these recordings are amazing i was lucky enough thanks to my friend uh, Ken Wilson, uh, one of his relatives passed away and he was a uh, Ron Britton, is that correct? Yeah, Ron Britton, a famous Chicago DJ. Uh, and he had a few of these old Jeanette sound effects records uh, that he would use on his radio show in Chicago in the 60s and 70s, which is kind of amazing. So the, one of the records I have is you can hear a Richmond, Indiana hotels bowling alley in the 1920s, which I just, you know, it, it's I, I'm kind of addicted. Um, so what is the legacy here? And this is kind of what I want to leave you with, right? Is this notion that, okay, so music happened there, a lot of recordings happened there. What, what's come of this? And here I'm particularly thinking of Richmond, but I'm also thinking about Louisville as a city. Uh, if we, if we kind of, you know, kind of hone in, not just in Kentucky, but also Louisville here. So Jeanette Records for years was, the, their industrial shop was just closed up. It was in decay. You could walk into the building in the 70s and just there was just paperwork laying around, right? Um, uh, at one point, actually, in the Depression, Decca Records buys Jeanette. And then Decca is later purchased by Mercury. And in the 1980s, Mercury is making John Mellencamp records. So, you know, it's this odd thing. It only occurred to me recently that actually all this activity in the teens and 20s in the Midwest is sets the groundwork for the Great Lakes Midwest and, and you know, this, I would say, this part of the South slash Midwest, depending on your point of view, uh, that we were making this stuff, you know, the TVs and the radios and the phonographs and the records and the CDs and the DVDs, we're making them, right? They come from here. Uh, um, and I, I need to go, if the GE Appliance Park has some archives, I should probably get down there and see what they've been up to apart from smart refrigerators and that sort of thing, like looking back. So, so you know, Jeanette's really come back. Their, their industrial works in uh, Richmond has become kind of a park and they do special events there. There's a jazz festival there. People do weddings there. All kinds of things are happening there. So they've cleaned it up. Um, when I first visited, there's a Jeanette Records mural there on the side from the 1920s. When I first visited this site, uh, uh, I guess some teen in the 1980s, I assume, had written in uh, um, like in spray paint above it, Depeche Mode, the uh, 1980s British synth pop band. So I thought, well, okay, Richmond likes Depeche Mode, okay. And then um, uh, more recently, um, uh, the Jeanette Studio has been recreated at the Indiana State Museum in Indianapolis. So it's not just happening in Richmond, you know, sort of around the state, they're starting to realize we have this sort of history, right? And so, you know, I, I think, you know, so when I was moving to Louisville from Austin, Texas, so what do you think people knew about Louisville when I, you know, announced that I was moving to Louisville? Some snobs were like, oh, where are you going? Boulder, San Francisco, New York, Chicago? 
where are you going? My, my wife would say, Kentucky. <laughs> and some of them would just be, oh, well, I'm sure you'll make friends. It'll be fine. But the smartest ones started talking about music and literature and culture. And they were like, oh, you know, and bourbon, of course. Uh, and so, you know, what would it look like? You know, Louisville, many of my friends in Austin, if they knew anything beyond Kentucky Fried Chicken and Muhammad Ali and all that, they wanted to talk to me about music. They wanted to talk to me about, about music from the 1990s in this city, right? For, well, for a year or two, this was the center of the indie rock universe. Did the city capitalize on that? Mm, sort of, you know, but what if we just decided to tell people like, hey, we're a music city because we are and we have been, right? And so what possibilities are there? Um, uh, Clayton McMission, the, uh, the fiddle player here, moved here from Georgia later on in his career. He toured all around, was on the radio. He ran a, a little grocery, I believe, on Spring Street uh, here in, uh, in Louisville. Uh, up in the upper corner, I'm referencing some other uh, country jazz blues. There's a lot more than I've got up here, but um, up there, Sarah Martin and Sylvester Weaver. Uh, Sarah Martin's buried at the uh, the, uh, the little cemetery there, Eastern Parkway, and Goss, right? So famous, she traveled the, the world um, singing the blues. Down there, um, Clifford Hayes, uh, Louisville Jug Band, right? And so the tradition goes back a long, long way. And the question is, you know, what do we what do we do with that history, uh, and how much do we know about it, and and would it benefit us uh, to take it more seriously, not just in terms of commerce or tourism or this sort of thing, but just to have a sense of of who we are and who we've been, and I think there's a lot uh, uh, we could be doing. I moved here from a city that knew how to make money on movies, and music, and tech, uh, and um, and Louisville may not know how to do that in quite the same way, but I think there are some real possibilities. So um, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Uh, thank you so much for coming out on a Tuesday night. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for that presentation. If anybody does have questions, we've got mics on either side of the room. Please uh, stand up and, uh, and ask. Um, I'll I'll kind of get us started, I guess, um, while y'all are getting in line for questions. Um, you called for us earlier to uh, to think about the history of the recording industry alongside these other media. Mm -hmm. You ended with a call for Louisville to recognize its uh, its contributions to the recording history. Mm -hmm. What's the broader media landscape in Louisville that we might associate with this sort of flourishing of recording culture in the, the 20s and 30s? Yeah, so, I mean, WHAS radio, I think, was so huge. And I, boy, I wish we had some audio of their coverage of the 1937 flood. Like, I don't know if anybody bought, I mean, it was, wouldn't that be amazing? to kind of hear that, hear those voices like in real time. Um, but WHS radio was hugely important, not just locally, but regionally. You know, there were a few regional radio stations that were really powerful early on, WHS, WLW Cincinnati, WLS Chicago. Uh, and so, you know, radio was definitely happening here. There's some film work here too, not a whole lot, but you'd always be surprised pretty much every city had some film activity and earlier than you might imagine. Uh, so before Hollywood became sort of a center of, of everything in certain ways, it was pretty dispersed around the country in places like Louisville, like there was, there was activity. In some cases, there were like these itinerant filmmakers that had two or three scripts that would travel the country and uh, say, hey, Danville, you wanna make a movie? We'll put the mayor in it. And they would shoot it, and then there would be a big opening night, you know, and that sort of thing. So there's all sorts of kind of media activity going on. But I, again, I think we're a culture to think that media is from elsewhere, uh, even when we're making it, you know, which is so interesting. I have to tell my students at Bellman is, you know, people wake up in the morning and they go work at MGM or they go work at Google or they go work at, you know, uh, uh, the big studios. It's a job, you know, <laughs> like other jobs. Uh, you know, and there are people that do that here. One of my recent graduates is a film colorist, uh, and he works here remotely. He, he color corrects movies for cinematographers from his apartment. So, you know. 
Well, I really appreciated um, your foregrounding of archival research um, here, and you showed us the documents and, and talked about those yeah. uh, those archival stories and that research process. Um, I always love the uh, the unexpected in the archive. What's the what's the thing that you found that uh, that maybe just kind of took your breath away, blew your mind, or or made you scratch your head? Yeah, I mean, I found so many things. So I'm a little jealous. Like the film art. Thank you for that. The film archives. You know, the studios remained big, and they held on to their paperwork. Record companies get bought and sold all the time. The barrier to entry is lower, so everyday folks can make records. But the companies themselves are smaller and so they might you know they might fold up shop the folks who were involved with Jeanette records went on to do like refrigerators and stainless steel things and that was just something they did for a while did they hold on to that paperwork sometimes or maybe not right columbia records has been bought and sold so many times it's now owned by sony do you think every iteration of the company kept the paperwork not very practical so, you know, so the archival stuff, so that man, I had to dig in archives that did have paper. I, I showed up at the New York Public Library unannounced after months of emails saying like, I had heard through collectors that you have an uncatalogued collection in your basement. And the libra librarians were like, I don't see anything in the database. And an archivist came by and said, he's right. <laughs> They put a sticker on my shirt. They took me three floors below, two or three floors below Lincoln Center. And they said, you can photocopy anything you find. Uh, just write in marker on the outside what is in the box. And that was the rest of my week, right? That was the rest of my week. And it was some foundational founding documents of like, OK Records logo, you know, Columbia Records, like early, early days kind of correspondence, right? And so I was getting a really up, up close picture of uh, of these labels. The other thing I'll just say quickly is um, when I was doing research in uh, Jeanette Records research in Richmond, Indiana, um, I was going to like the Chamber of Commerce and like they had a little side room where the Richmond, Indiana business immortals were like up on the wall. And then I got, uh, you know, I'd go through these file cabinets basically. Um, and then they took me down to where the Jeanette studio was, this little building that had been torn down, like it's gone, just the bricks there. But this sort of older fella pulls, takes a brick, he hands it to me, he says, Big Spider Bag, Gene Autry, Pokey Carmichael, Alberta Hunter, you know, going through all the names of the folks who recorded there. He hands me the brick. I put the brick, it, it's got this nice little carrying case for it and everything. I put it in my luggage. I get back to the, to the airport in Indianapolis to fly to Austin. And then the folk, folks at the, uh, at the gate said, uh, Mr. Barnett, it appears here that your luggage is now overweight. Uh, <laughs> And then I was like, oh, it's the brick. But I took it with me. I paid for the brick. I mean, like, well, what are you going to do? Uh, but I mean, like, it just, that's why I love the archival thing because I don't, I think if people do a little archival work, you get the bug and you realize how little we know and how much is back there. So I really have that detective sort of urge. So I too love the archival stuff. And you're part of the reason I have the bug. Mm -hmm. But so my question's a bit of existential dread that I've been toying with. <laughs> you got to dig through crates. You got to dig through file cabinets. Yeah. People are making media like crazy now. And like, especially with like SoundCloud and GarageBand, like yeah. recording industry has been democratized yeah. in a crazy way. Who's going to be able to study that? How do you think they'll be able to do it? Like, I know, rough. I mean, I think so. Thank, thank, thank God the archivists are working on this and, and people much smarter than me. Uh, you folks at the Filson are trying to sort of figure this sort of thing out. And I know there's a lot of work going on, but you're right. It's exponential and it's sort of a blessing. The stockpile is always a blessing and is always a curse, right? And so I think that's, that's some, of what's go, some of what goes on. Um, uh, I mean, I when media democratizes, I tend to be a fan. Uh, but you know, yeah, I mean, I think storage is going to be an issue. We have to rethink things. A lot of the media that we're we're holding on to is not very stable, uh, and so we have to think about what's the most stable format to store things in. And again, it's smarter people than me working through it. 
But I think about like all this more sort of ephemeral media that's lost, like all that local television. Where did it go? Some of those rec some of those uh, TV companies are gone. Are those shows, those kids shows you love, the the dance show, the bandstand show, the the local bandstand show, whatever? Like, where are the? Where is that footage? And can we still find it to save it? You know, like I I don't know. Like, who are the people collecting TV, for instance, like TV footage, right, uh, or film footage, or, or sound recordings? You know, and so, yeah, I. I'm at work with the head of the Bellman Library on this project. Uh, uh, all, lots of enthusiasm and no money. It's called uh, the Bellman Media Archive. And we're trying to build a sort of a history of, of Bellman and, and Bellman's intersections with the rest of the world through media. And I think we started it in like 2013. So <laughs> we're still at it. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, I've noticed that there's a, sort of a phenomenon where formats themselves become, uh, you know, rise and fall in popularity and become quote unquote cool. So, you know, LPs almost die, but then they become cool again. And, you know, if a lot of people, if they're buying any kind of physical media right. music, they're buying LPs, mm -hmm. but even like, I think some bands are putting out cassettes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which seems bizarre to me because it's such a weird, it's a, hmm. They sound so terrible, but um, has that always been kind of a phenomenon or like after, like, so when records died during the depression, mm -hmm. was was there an early collector culture uh, of yeah. like music freaks who were holding on to them and insisted that they sounded better? And, mm -hmm. you know, and and did, like, has that cycle always kind of happened? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't, thank you for that. I don't know. I don't know if they had arguments about audio quality quite in the way that we do, but absolutely, there were folks that, you know, uh, Joe Bussard, the record collector, who, you know, he had thousands of 78s, and he famously said, you know, there's no good music after 19, 1930, you know. Uh, and so, for, you know, so, but yeah, I think there, there's always been these kind of battles over formats and people love this or that thing. Uh, and I think that's going to continue, although now in, in the sort of present climate, I think we're able to sort of fetishize and and and, and sell things in, in kind of new ways. There's a there's a record company called Sacred Bones that just brought back the eight track tape. Uh, and so there's certain certain 70s artists I think should be heard on eight track tape. Deep Purple to me, Alice Cooper should be on eight track tape to me. Uh, but um, but so there's someone always out there that loves the format. Um, uh, the fascinating fascinating thing about 78s, just real, real brief, briefly, is like they include the resin, the remnants of a lac bug. Like there are actual like ancient insects in shellac, the lac bug and the resin from the lac bug. So it's a very biological, weird sort of thing. Also, shellac was really expensive. I didn't know this until recently. I mean, a couple of years back. Blew my mind that there are bugs in old shellac, you know, or at least resin from bugs. Uh, the other thing is that um, uh, these record companies like Jeanette and uh, Paramount Records and sort of inexpensive labels didn't want to spend all that money on shellac. So they would look for things that they could put in the shellac to stretch their dollar. So like wood pulp, uh, like actual stone, like using stone <laughs> and breaking stone, just anything they could do to like cut costs, you know? So it's just kind of crazy so and by the way present day format battle that's going on is like uh, i as an old-timer uh, gen xer uh refer to records as vinyl whereas my undergraduates refer to them as vinyls plural and so i'm trying to make the case that um vinyl is plural in the way that deer are plural so there's one deer and many deer but i may be losing this battle i gave away all my vinyl um I, going back to a, a comment you made about uh, documentation and, and finding uh, material from record companies, I'm wondering if radio stations, both the 50,000 watt WLW, WLAC, WWL in New Orleans, those places, as well as the tiny little uh, uh, 5,000 watt uh, stations around in the country if they kept things 
I mean, some of them did. Some of them like made sure to take them to a local archive. The the Jeanette archive I worked in at the Indiana Historical Society in Indianapolis uh, is there because the widow of a record collector and uh, enthusiast scholar, essentially, from the Pacific Northwest, when he died, she made sure all the materials went to the Historical Society in Indiana. Sometimes it's quite random. Uh, there's a lo that local county history archive I went to in Richmond, Indiana. Um, one day there was a really kind of miffed clerk at the front desk in this tiny little county historical society archive. He brings out this log book. He drops it on my desk. Boom. And he goes like, everybody always comes here to study genetic records, but no one ever looks at this. And I'm like, well, what's, what's that? And he goes, this is early work on television by Charles Francis Jenkins. He was working on mechanical TV, and one of the very first public projections of television happened in Richmond, Indiana, and there's a plaque downtown, and who knows about that? You know, they're like, wow. And so then, then the question becomes, what do the other kind of historical societies have? And how would we even find out? Like, so now I'm dreaming of like a digital aggregating kind of thing that would like, you could search all the county historical societies, all the town historical societies, you know, all these sorts of places. But even after that, who, you know, who has records in their attic or old TV shows or film? And then what happens when they're gone? It's awfully easy, much a lot easier to put it in, in a dumpster. A couple of years back here in the South End, uh, a, a friend of mine, Nathan Salzberg, the musician and uh, kind of an archivist, uh, was called by friends of his saying, there's a bunch of country 78s in this big, container in the south end bring all your friends drive here and they they all pulled up and started loading these 78s into these cars Salzburg took those recordings uh, and put them into this three cd collection that later won a grammy award right and it was you know it was 78s out of a dumpster in the south end right so i mean it really comes down to i mean you, we can't save everything right the archivists know that, right? But then you also worry about what could we still save, you know, that needs to be saved. And yeah, that's, that's, you know, like with architecture, there's always a little heartbreak involved, you know, and the demol demolition man shows up. So. Well, I think we have to close our formal program for tonight. We do have some copies of the book for sale. Um, as well. So please be sure to pick that up here or elsewhere. Can we get another hand for Kyle Barnett? Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks.